My dear friends, please remain standing out of respect for the hearing of God's holy word from the Gospel of Mark. We read these words. John was in the wilderness calling people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am coming after me. I'm not worthy to bend over and loosen the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens splitting open and the Spirit like a dove coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love. In you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out of the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> well, many of you know that I am a graduate of Columbia College, and a part of my undergraduate degree was something called public affairs, which meant that I did a combination of study in political science and history. So I like little tidbits of historical facts, and I want to see how many of y'all remember this historical fact. Back in April of 1985, it was announced on worldwide, worldwide news that the Coca-Cola company was doing something. Oh, some of you know exactly what it was. They were taking the original Coke off of the shelves and replacing it with something they called New Coke. How many of y'all liked New Coke? Right. It wasn't that New Coke was going to be on the shelves right beside the original Coke. If it had been, maybe it wouldn't have been such a fiasco, right? But what they did was they took all of the original recipe off of the shelf totally and replaced it with New Coke. Now, I'm sure that before they did that, they had a lot of focus groups, and they did a lot of research, and they tried to figure out, you know, what's the best formula, and we're going to do this, and this is going to be a great and wonderful thing. But it ended up being one of the most egregious er errors ever in the food and beverage industry because people had a problem with that New Coke. And so the stock of Coke started to plummet. And all of the celebrities who were on those commercials and those advertisements promoting the new Coke saw a devastating effect on their careers. And so as people started fleeing the Coke brand by the millions, the executives at Coke finally announced on July 11th of 1985, just three months after they introduced new Coke, that they were pulling new Coke off the shelves and replacing it with the original recipe once again. And this is a quote from the CEO of Coke at that time. He said, This is the simple fact. The fact is that all the time and money and skill that we poured into consumer research on the new Coke could not measure or reveal the deep and abiding emotional attachment to the original Coke felt by so many people. Now, I share all of that with you today 
because I feel like within the church and the church's history, every now and again, there are people like those Coke executives who want to mess with the original recipe that God gave to us in the Holy Scriptures about how we are to live in community with one another. There are people who want to mess with how we do church and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and what it means to be faithful in living out our call. Every now and again within the church's history, there are people who want to change the way that we do things. And our brand, if you will, becomes tainted and people flee from the church. It is no surprise to any of us that our particular denomination has been in decline ever since 1968. Now those persons who look around the sanctuary and say, oh, the pews used to be filled when Pastor so-and-so was here. We just need someone like Pastor so-and-so and the pews will be filled again. I'm sorry. The world has changed and things have changed. People have been fleeing. And in our particular time in history right now, our United Methodist denomination, as you know, is going through a time of turmoil and dissension. Someone mentioned to me just this week that they were looking at the Washington Street United Methodist Church website and the website of a sister United Methodist Church. They were praising us for our website because on the front page of our website, we list our mission statement and our vision statement that we are a church that believes in loving God and loving others and that we proclaim that boldly and without apology, that the doors are open to people of all ages, nations, and races, that we follow that baptismal covenant of opening the doors and affirming the value and the worth of every individual. The Sister United Methodist Church, on their front page of their website, list. Here are the times we are meeting to talk about separating from the United Methodist denomination. Here are the reasons we want to separate from the denomination. If you want more information, come to these meetings. And the person sharing that with me said, as an outsider looking at those two websites, what they saw is that Washington Street United Methodist Church is a church that knows who we are that we are following our calling as children of God to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. And the sister church is a church that right now is quarreling with one another about their identity and who they are. And this person said to me, which church would you want to walk into? A church that is arguing among themselves or a church that knows who they are and wants to proclaim the love and the light of Christ everywhere they go. On this Epiphany Sunday, this season of Epiphany, it is called Epiphany, the manifestation of Christ when the Magi came and it was made known to the world that Jesus came not just for the Jews but for all people, for the Gentiles as well. It is a season in which we historically remember the baptism of Christ. When Christ's identity was claimed and named, he heard the heavens open up and said, You are my son, with you I am well pleased. When Jesus came to identify with each and every one of us and to remind us that when we enter those waters of baptism, we die with Christ and we are raised with Christ, and we hear that same voice from God saying, with you, I am well pleased. You are beloved. That is your identity. In the baptismal waters, Jesus' true identity is revealed to us, made manifest to us. 
And in the baptismal waters, we are reminded of our true identity as children of God. Robert Frost, the poet, has said, home is the place that when you go there, they have to take you in. And Jesus has said that the church, the community of faith, is our true home. The place where you go that they have to take you in. For we are all God's children. A certain pastor in a small Midwest town <clears throat> tells of a time when a nondescript woman came to worship and she sat in the very back corner of the church. He noticed her during the entire worship service and after the service, she came up to him and she asked him, she said, Pastor, I would like for you to baptize my new grandson. And the pastor said, well, I'm going to need to talk to the child's parents. Will you have them call me? And the woman said, well, the child's mother is my 18-year-old daughter. And we don't know where to find the father of this child. Well, in that small town, all of the townspeople knew exactly what they thought of this teenage daughter. And they had their own opinions about that father who left town when he found out that the child was to be born. And they also had their opinions about that 18-year-old's parents and grandparents. The people were going around calling that child illegitimate. And the pastor said that he just wanted to scream every time he heard that word. For he said, no child. Some water. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> <clears throat> he said, no child is illegitimate. There may be illegitimate adults, but there are no children who are illegitimate Children don't get to choose how they come into the world. So to, despite the fears of what the town people might say, the pastor told that grandmother, yes, I will baptize your grandson. And on the Sunday when the young mother came in with her baby and her grandmother, the pastor asked the question that he always asked in that little church whenever there was a baptism. He asked, who will stand with his child? And at first, the only person to stand with that mother and baby was the grandmother. So the pastor was about to continue with that baptismal service when all of a sudden the most respected older man in the congregation stood, followed by his wife. And shortly after that, the sixth grade Sunday school teacher stood up. And then another and another. And within minutes, the entire congregation was standing with that little baby, the 18-year-old mother, and the grandmother. They were living out, the pastor said, the scripture that he had shared with him that day, those familiar words that say, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and those who love are born of God and know God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. The pastor said, in that baptism service those day, that day, those words came alive. Those words were clothed in the flesh of those people, and everyone in that community knew it. My friends, when such love happens, it happens when we remember our baptism when we remember who we are, when we remember that every single one of us is named and claimed by God and that we belong to God in love. And when we let God win our hearts, 
We are called to live in such a way that we do not allow others' hearts to be broken. And that brings me to the second point that I want to bring today. As I go through this sermon series of rediscovering our roots, I want to touch on the essential parts of what it means to follow Christ. And I think back over the history of the church and I realize that so often when we've gone astray, we have forgotten that love is the essential of the church. Back in the 1700s, there was a gentleman who thought we ought to go back to the original recipe that Christ built for the church, being built on the foundation of love, being built on a foundation of fellowship with one another. He realized that the church had strayed, and the church had become about a building and about a hierarchy and about rules and following those rules. And so this young man named John Wesley, who was a fellow and a student at Oxford University, said, this is absurd. We need to love people where they are. We need to have communion and fellowship with one another. And he became very methodical about the way he went about following the recipe of being a follower of Christ. He was so methodical that his critics called him a Methodist. He never intended to start this denomination. He simply wanted the church to be the church that Christ had called it to be. He wanted us to live by our baptismal covenant. He wanted us to live in fellowship and communion with God and with one another. And the leaders of the church said to Wesley, you can't do that. And he said, do what? They said, you can't go out to the mines and preach to the miners out there. They need to come into the church. And Wesley said, but they can't come into the church. So I'm going to go out to where they are and share the good news of Christ with them and tell them that all their past failures have been forgiven by Christ, and that they can start anew, that they are valued and loved simply because of who they are. And the leaders of the church said to Wesley, but you can't do that. And he said, but there are people in the new world who need communion taken to them. They need to experience the sacrament of love and forgiveness like we will celebrate today. And the leaders of the church said, but there's no one who is ordained, who is qualified with the qualifications to serve communion to the people in the new world. And Wesley said, I will have lay people do it. I will consecrate the elements and send it through them. Communion needs to be shared. The table of Christ is wide and it is open to all people. Wesley wanted to emphasize love over power, love over everything else. He wanted to emphasize a fellowship. And so he said, we're going to the hospitals where people are hurting and needing to hear the good news of God's love and care for them. And so the Methodist church throughout the years has built many hospitals. Wesley said, we need to go into the prisons as Jesus said, when I was imprisoned, you visited me. We need to go where the people are and remind them. Remind them of the essentials of life, loving God and loving neighbor as self. Wesley said we're going to educate rather than indoctrinate. We're going to love and we're going to care. And we're going to go right down the middle because when you go to the extremes... You pull away from the central message of the gospel. He understood balance in life. And he understood that Christianity is both personal and social. That it's about me and Jesus and my relationship with Christ, but it is also about sharing with others. 
and doing the work, resisting evil in whatever forms they present themselves, as our baptismal covenant reminds us. We've got to love the world the way Jesus loves us. We've got to reach out with help and hope and healing. There's a tension in that, my friends, but it's a tension that we are called to live in, a tension of sharing with others the importance of following the way of love, the doctrine of love in all that we do. There was a young girl a member of a much-loved British Methodist church. She was six years old, and she was in the nativity play. She had a little minor part. She played the angel in that play. And she was the one who had to utter the line, Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. She rehearsed that line over and over again, Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. But on the night of the performance, when she stood before that crowd of people, she became a bit nervous. And instead of reciting the line as perfectly as she had for so many weeks before her family, she froze and suddenly blurted out, Behave, I bring you Glad tidings of great joy. <laughs> I think so often the church has strayed from the original recipe and we have preached a gospel of behave. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. The message is not behave before you receive grace and love. The message is you are loved because you are God's child. You are loved and forgiven, and you are called to live a life of love and joy and help and hope and healing and to bring that good news to others. Baptism is not about us being worthy before God. It is God's grace gift to us. In baptism, God's Spirit is at work in our life. Just as that dove descended on Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God, with us to help us do the things and to be the people that God is calling us to be. You are named, my friends, and precious in God's eyes as God's creation. Please. Don't let others tell us what it means to follow Christ. Listen to the words of God. Listen to the words of Christ. Remember your baptism. You don't have to remember it physically, but remember that you are a baptized person. When I was a student at Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, my homiletics professor, a preaching professor, loved to remind us that we are people who are walking wet, wet with the waters of baptism. And we need to be reminded of that over and over again, that we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do the work that God has called us to do to do the work of justice and mercy and love in this world. That's what this meal reminds us of every time we celebrate it. We come together to this table to eat the bread and drink from the cup, to be reminded that because God so loved the world, he sent his son to remind us that we too are named and claimed as children of God, a meal that will nourish us, nourish us and remind us of the grace of God at work within us. So let us prepare our hearts to receive this meal now as we join together in the great thanksgiving. <laughs>